Christopher Dawson is one of the most interesting but least known thinkers of the 20th century. Russell Kirk called him one of the principal social thinkers of his age. And for Dawson, the rise and spread of totalitarianism in the five decades after World War I was the key trend of the 20th century. Later figures following him believe that the most important yardstick for judging the events of our time was whether they serve totalitarian domination or not. He believed that in modern politics, power had replaced liberty as the chief principle of culture. Individual rights were being subordinated more and more to the demands of society and of an increasingly omnipotent and omnipresent state and that these claims were as extensive as religions. All modern politics, he felt, shared these traits to some degree. He credited Cardinal Newman with foreseeing totalitarianism's precursors, and believed that the modern West was post-Christian. What he meant by this was that Catholicism had lost its centrality as the integrating principle of Western civilization. Various movements... Protestantism, the Enlightenment, French revolutionary ideals, industrialism, socialism, nationalism, liberalism, even democracy itself had tried to take its place, but all had failed. And he believed that totalitarianism was fertilised by their decay. It wasn't so much about the breakdown of the traditional culture of Christendom, but the catastrophe of the secular culture which has taken its place. Accordingly, he felt that totalitarianism drew from the anti-humanism that he linked to Protestantism, drew from the anthropocentrism of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, drew also from the socialist and nationalist beliefs in one's class or nation as the ultimate object of human allegiance. And he saw the French Revolution as the ultimate matrix of the idea that there is no higher duty than the service of the state as the civic ethos. There were also economic forces involved in totalitarianism, he warned. Industrialism, in his view, was contrary to the heritage of England, which he saw as essentially rural an agrarian. Based on a mechanistic metaphysic, it was also contrary to the spirit of Catholicism, because it aimed at a technological civilization devoted to purely secular and material ends. And the expanding economic power of the state led to a worrying increase in its control over individuals. And he believed this was in accordance with the inherent needs of a highly organized industrial society. The solution, he felt, was an anti-modern, decentralized, more agrarian socio-economic model. And he feared that interference with economic liberty might entail a loss of political freedom. Total economic planning produces a planned culture, which in his view is a machine-made culture, which differs from one country to another only in so far as the process of mechanization is more or less perfected. This spirit of collectivism means that there will be no department of life in which the state will not intervene and which will not be obliged to conform to the mechanized order of the new society. According to him, totalitarianism is a species of technocracy in which there is no room for independent centers of action. Our modern technological society, he wrote, has become so tightly organized that it absorbs almost the whole life of the individual and controls his activities and even his thoughts. What industrialism had begun, therefore, totalitarianism had perfected. And on this, Marxists like Herbert Marcuse agreed. But Dawson was most concerned about the threat to the family. He regarded the family as the core unit of not only English civilization, but of the Christian church. And he saw its fate as a touchstone. He claimed that if the primary social unit 
is a natural biological group which is defended by the strongest moral and religious sanctions. Society can never become sheer mechanism, nor can the economic organisation of the state absorb the whole life of the citizen. Family is the primary line of defence against an omnipotent society. But he warned that the industrial revolution's focus on group work in mines and factories promoted the disintegration of the family into a number of independent wage earners and the degeneration of the home into a worker's dormitory. Because of this, it inhibited the family's ability to enculturate its members in its national and religious heritages. Ultimately, this would lead, he feared, to an eroding of these essential ethical and spiritual safeguards against totalitarianism. So he saw the chief problem of the age as preserving the minimum social autonomy required for the family's survival in a secular, collectivist culture. For him, industrial capitalism is nothing else but economic liberalism. And he argued that the essential principle of the totalitarian state was in fact asserted by liberalism before fascism was ever heard of. He distinguished between two forms of democracy. The constitutional variety had, he believed, very clearly defined limits of state power. It included aristocratic elements in its makeup, and he saw this variety of democracy as compatible with the political heritage of England and Christian beliefs. Absolute democracy, on the other hand, he considered hostile to both and one of the main substitutes for religion in the modern age. He judged totalitarianism as its direct intellectual descendant and traced its roots to Rousseau. The common ethical denominator of liberal, absolute democratic and totalitarian notions like fascism and communism, he believed, was their adherence to two precepts. The first was hostility to tradition. They cut man off from his social past, leaving him isolated to face the enormous pressure of contemporary materialism. The second was that they are all manifestations of illicit immanentism. So the emphasis is on temporal perfectibility. Dawson writes that all these new Jerusalems are earthly cities established by the will and power of man. And if we believe that the kingdom of heaven can be established by political or economic measures, that it can be an earthly state, then we can hardly object to the claims of such a state to embrace the whole of life and to demand the total submission of the individual will and conscience. From the Catholic point of view, there is a fundamental error in all this. That error is the ignoring of original sin and its consequences or rather the identification of the fall with some defective political or economic arrangement. That point is absolutely crucial, and we'll be returning to it later. The ignoring of original sin and its consequences, or rather the identification of the fall with some defective political or economic arrangement. If that defective arrangement can be remedied, all these movements argue, then the new Jerusalem can be built on earth. Heaven can be built on earth. Now this insight led him to believe that all modern political ideologies and systems are potentially totalitarian. Communism in Russia, National Socialism in Germany, and capitalism and liberal democracy in the Western countries are really, he wrote, three forms of the same thing. And they are all moving by different but parallel paths to the same goal which is the mechanization of human life and the complete subordination of the individual to the state and to the economic process. All treat the state as a final end and are unwilling to tolerate any division of spiritual allegiance. All modern states are totalitarian insofar as they seek to embrace the sphere of economics and culture, as well as politics in the strict sense of the word. They have taken on responsibility for all the different forms of communal activity which were formerly left to the individual 
or to independent social organisations, such as the churches, and they watch over the welfare of their citizens, from the cradle to the grave. Hence what he called the all-pervading pressure of a collectivist civilization. The only difference between these forms of the modern state, he believed, was whether they made a deliberate breach with the old liberal tradition, or whether they achieved the breach without any violent cataclysm, disguising their totalitarian character by a liberal ideology. Either way, the mechanization of social and economic life, however, was leading to society as an immense social machine, able to work smoothly so long as every wheel and cog performed its task with unvarying regularity. A Westerner in a modern liberal democracy, Dawson believed, thinks he is choosing a career, but really he's in the same position as the subject of a totalitarian state who is assigned a career because each must participate in the technological order to survive. The aim is a regime of utter social and cultural conformity. Liberalism, democracy, socialism and nationalism to Dawson are all substitute religions and he analyzed their totalitarian tendencies accordingly. Liberal individualism had failed as a surrogate faith because it couldn't satisfy man's religious nature and religious need for community and the sense of an ultimate end. This led to the urge to replace the utilitarian individualism of the liberal capitalist state by a new spiritual community. Since man is essentially spiritual, any power that claims to control the whole man is forced to transcend relative and particular aims and to enter the sphere of absolute values, Dawson argued. And such regimes claim man's spiritual allegiance, even in the things that are not Caesar's. In other words, by politicizing being, they function as a proxy creed. Dawson writes that totalitarian ideologies have a creed and a dogma. They have an ideology and a social philosophy and a code of ethics and moral values. Finally, they form a secular church, a community of believers with its own very highly organized hierarchy of institutions and authorities. And he warned that traditional absolutism and modern totalitarianism are as akin as gunpowder and the atomic bomb. The planned society marks a change in human civilization greater than anything that has occurred since the end of the Stone Age. What he meant by that was this. Unlike past dictatorships, totalitarianism demands control, not merely of people's behavior, but also of their feelings and thoughts. He argued that it uses all the resources of modern psychology to make the human soul the motor of its dynamic purpose. It is only since the advent of the new scientific techniques for the measurement and control of public opinion and of the new psychological techniques for the mass conditioning of the emotions that the new form of spiritual despotism has become possible. So it's a marriage of modern psychological discoveries and invasive technology. It aims at an artificially conditioned collective consciousness as the sole driving force of the social organism, and it breeds a new principle of political authority. It demands complete obedience and unlimited devotion from its members. And the moment that a society claims the complete allegiance of its members, it assumes a quasi-religious authority, and hence becomes a competitor with the church on its own ground. Going further than that, it actually aims at reversing the Christian moral values while demanding the same unlimited sacrifices and an undivided allegiance. So this makes the totalitarian state an exclusive, dogmatic anti-religion. It aims at extending secular norms through the whole social structure until they infuse the life of the common people no less than the thoughts of the leading classes and groups. And Dawson stressed this as a particular concern. The common people 
had previously been the mainstay of the resistance to secularizing agents like the Reformation, the French Revolution. He feared that they would disappear as the last bulwark against a completely politicized order. Cardinal Newman had labeled liberalism the totalitarian antichrist, and Dawson's imagination seems to have been plagued by similarly apocalyptic images. He saw that totalitarians sought not merely to persecute Christianity, but to eradicate it and its post-Christian remnant. He cautioned that the modern totalitarian state has a power of control over the lives and thoughts of its members which no ancient state ever possessed. And consequently, we are doubtful of the power of Christianity to face this new power as it faced its persecutors in the past. It was a threat extending not merely across the entire social order, but within the whole person as well. No loyalty beyond politics is tolerated. Every moral or religious element that may conflict with the realization of the aim of the totalitarian state is ruthlessly eliminated. And thus such a system is irreconcilable with religion in general and with Christianity in particular. The danger of such a system to religion, he argued, is not so much the danger of persecution or open hostility. It is simply that it leaves no room for religion to exist. The total psychic energy of the community is absorbed by its planned activity and nothing is left over for other ends. In the past, religion has always been able to make use of the free surplus of psychic energy. Caesar demanded his tribute and the man himself was left to serve God or not, as the case might be. But now Caesar no longer asks for anything. He is everything. He takes the whole man. He is the people's state and therefore the whole life of the people is in him and for him. So Dawson worried that the church would either be destroyed or co-opted by the totalitarian system. He believed that Christianity itself could never be crushed completely, but nevertheless he feared that its traditional institutional expression could eventually become superfluous. And this was a lament for not just the church, but for the culture the church had built. Catholic Christianity, Dawson argued, is the basis of Western civilization, and the totalitarian threat is directed against Western culture as a whole, as well as against Christianity. So all representatives of the Western heritage needed to realize urgently, Dawson argued, that this was not a conventional theological persecution. Instead, it was an assault on a culture, a tradition, whose heritage and treasures included natural law, humanism, and ordered liberty. He wrote that the Christian cause at the present moment is also the common cause of all who are defending our civilization against the blind assault of mass despotism and the idolatry of power, which has resulted in a new paganism that is destructive of all moral and intellectual values. The greatest danger is the internal disintegration of Western culture by the ideologies which are anti-Christian or anti-humanist. So he thought there could be secular motives for wishing to save the civilization that Catholic Christianity had created. But ultimately, he believed that the source of the disorder and malady of Europe is spiritual, and it can only be healed by spiritual means. Defiance of it, he regarded as a Christian duty. Christianity is bound to protest against any social system which claims the whole of man and sets itself up as the final end of human action, for it asserts that man's essential nature transcends all political and economic forms. He hoped that totalitarianism would prove so oppressive to human nature, so ultimately self-destructive, that it must inevitably produce a reaction of resistance and revolt in which the Christian elements in Western civilization will once more make themselves felt. Because he believed Catholic social teaching to be fuller, clearer, and more systematic than that of other Christian bodies, he believed Catholicism best placed to lead this natural uprising. He believed that Pope Leo XIII was a 19th century foreseer of totalitarianism's 20th century advent, and he also cited Pius XII's contribution to this heritage, noting how he condemned totalitarianism as a surrogate religion that denied natural law. Only Catholicism, he believed, could 
form an effective counterweight to totalitarianism. Catholics had replaced liberals as the chief advocates of freedom in his day and were the main contemporary defenders of Western culture against totalitarianism. Most powerfully, he argued that the heirs and successors of the makers of Europe had to put aside petty differences to come together to face the common threat. When the totalitarians of the left deny freedom and the totalitarians of the right reject law, the old distinctions have become meaningless and Catholics are obliged to unite in order to defend principles far more vital than the issues of the left-right party dogfight. The old political attitudes and party alignments are as inappropriate as the old military tactics are in regard to the atomic bomb. And he saw all non-Catholic defenders of Western culture as allies against the totalitarian Antichrist. He regarded the doctrine of the universal kingship of Christ as the church's ultimate answer to the universal claims of the totalitarian systems. The church, he believed, stands for the deeper spiritual realities and traditions which secular civilization has lost and for lack of which is dying. The choice isn't between individualism and some form of collectivism, but between a collectivism which is purely mechanistic and one which is spiritual. He advocated a return from individualism to an organic spiritual order. In politics, this must be grounded in the principles of Catholic social teaching, especially the belief that fallen man ought to have only limited power over his fellows. He stressed that the Catholic conception of society is not that of a machine for the production of wealth, but of a spiritual organism in which every class and every individual has its own function to fulfill and its own rights and duties in relation to the whole. What distinguishes Catholic corporatism from fascist corporatism is a corporative community of free agents rather than a corporative rule by elite diktat. The state will not be a coercive regulator of personal beliefs. Dawson wrote that, of course, if it is totalitarian to claim authority over the whole of human life, then Christianity is totalitarian, and so are all the other world religions. But this is a misuse of terms, for totalitarian is essentially a political concept and implies a totalitarian state, whereas the fundamental distinction which Catholics make between church and state and spiritual and temporal authority is the opposite of totalitarianism and is perhaps the only ultimate defense of man's spiritual freedom against the totalitarian challenge and the growing pressure of the secular state. That exemplifies Dawson's clear sense of the radically different roles of the state in the two orders. All attempts to build a new Jerusalem out of the crooked timber of humanity would ultimately end in the Babylons of the brutality of Belson or the Gulag. Dawson's fundamental insight is that the power and the glory are not of this world.